I'm going to start a new series of messages with you this morning that I'm really excited about that we're going to call Christ the Healer. Christ the Healer. Jesus is our healer. And Wayne, both Wayne and Faye really have set the tone of the atmosphere of this meeting this morning by the Spirit of God. This message has already been set up well by the words that we've heard, by the encouragement that we've received, and the prayers that have been prayed over this place. We're going to be looking in the weeks to come in relation to Christ being our healer, how God has provided complete healing and wholeness for every single area of our lives in Jesus. And the title of this morning's message is Paid in Full. Paid in Full. Payment has been made for your salvation. Payment has been made in full, not partial, but in full through the power of the cross that Jesus died on. Jesus Christ has paid in full for all of the provision that we might need in this life, and especially in the area of healing within our bodies, within our minds, and within our souls. Payment has been made on the cross for, for, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, for us to be healed, for us to live whole. We are not the debtors to sin. We are not the debtors to sickness. No, Jesus carried that for each and every one of us on the cross. And that's why we celebrate. That's why we sing. That's why we can live every day in newness of life, in Him, in confident expectation, ready to receive whatever He might have for us in any given day because of the access that we get to Him through the cross. We're accepted in the Beloved. We are not rejected, but we are accepted in the Beloved through His cross, through His death, and through His Resurrection. Payment has been made in full for us to receive all of God's blessings, all of God's wonderful provisions for our lives. Now, over the course of our lives, there are times when we can face very real challenges in our health. We recognize that. Physical challenges, mental challenges. And even spiritual challenges come sometimes that seem impossible to move beyond. Some of the prayer requests that we've heard about this morning, they're very real challenges that people are facing that seem so insurmountable, towering over them, mountainous challenges that seem very real and are very real, and almost impossible to move. As a church family, we know of situations today where our brothers and sisters are struggling with very real challenges in their bodies. Their bodies need healing. Within our church family, there are, there are brothers and sisters that may not be here this morning, that may be watching online, because they are facing very real challenges, physical challenges in their bodies, fighting disease, fighting sickness. Others may not be here because they are overcome by mental or spiritual sickness and disease that's trying to take them out, that's trying to destroy them. No, these times come. We recognize that. We understand that there is an enemy against us that, what, that seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus, in John chapter 10, declares it clearly. He said, but I have come that you might have life, and life more 
abundantly on another occasion. It's noted that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, triumphing over him in the cross. For this purpose was the Son of God manifest to destroy the works of the evil one. And I believe as we've worshipped and praised God this morning, I believe that burdens have lifted, yokes have broken, and even sickness and disease has had to leave and will leave as the Word of God is declared and the praises of God's people is heard. We're going to see, and we have seen, the healing power of God move in our bodies, in our lives, in the lives of our families, in the lives of our friends, in the lives of fellow believers that are struggling. We stand with them, don't we? As God's people, we stand with them in prayer. And our confidence, our confidence is in the Word of God, in the promises of God. That's what we put our faith in. That's what we put our trust in. Sometimes the facts that we face in life can seem so final. Sometimes the doctor's reports and the reports and the symptoms that we feel within our bodies or in our minds or in our hearts can seem to overcome us and seem so insurmountable. But there is no life fact that is final before God. He is the God that moves mountains. He is the God that encourages us and exhorts us that when we stand before a mountain, He exhorts us that even the small mustard seed-like faith that we have and hold in our heart can speak to that mountain and see it moved and overturned so that His will can be worked out in our lives. I'm so glad, you know, amidst all of the final facts that seem to stack up against our lives, I'm so glad that in those dark moments of life where things seem so uncertain, we can turn to the Word of God. We can turn to the promises of God and smile at impossibility, smile with confidence at any situation that may seem contrary to God's Word, we can take hold of the Word of God and hold it in our heart and place our confidence and faith right there. I love how Wayne opened this service when he talked about fear. Fear is a very real thing. It's very real, and it it can really captivate you. And hold you down and, 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 and limit you and, and, and put a ceiling on your life. But it's wonderful that perfect love casts out all fear. Praise God. Perfect love. The love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit is more than able to deal with any fear that would try to dictate and order our steps. No, fear is not going to order our steps. No, fear is not going to determine our future. The love of God in our hearts that turns our minds toward the Word of God, that's what's going to determine our steps. That's what's going to unfold our future. God's Word, God's promises. That's what we, that's what we look to. No, facts aren't final. It doesn't mean we bury our head in the sand and kick our feet in the air and say, no, no, it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist. No, it does exist. But we face facts with the Word of God. We face facts with the Spirit of God. We face life's facts, not as final facts, but subject to change. Hallelujah. Because we hold the Word of God in our hearts. Amen? J.I. Packer wrote a book many years ago titled Knowing God. And the book is an amazing study about God's character. And through that book, Packer challenges his readers by saying, many times when we think about God, we view Him through the wrong end of the telescope. 
going on to explain. He says that the telescope is designed to bring that which is far, far away up close and into the reach of the observing mind. However, if we make the mistake of looking through the wrong end of the telescope, instead of seeing things up close and in detail, the things that we're looking at are cast far, far away into, into darkness. darkness. Parker, Parker writes, sadly, sadly people do this all the time with God. They, they use their feelings and thoughts and life experiences as a lens to look at God with. And through that lens, God is projected far, far away by looking through the lens of life experience People create a caricature of God that's cold, distant, unloving, uninvolved, and even non-existent. But Packer goes on to say that when we use the Word of God as our lens, instead of seeing God as far, far away, we see the eternal God as up close and personal, not cold or distant, or remote, or removed, or uninvolved. But no, when we use God's Word as the scope for our mind to look through, to magnify God with, we see Him as loving, compassionate, a God of mercy, whose mercies are new every morning with unfailing faithfulness towards us. You use God's Word as the scope for your life to look through, and you'll see Him as a God who is ever-present in times of trouble to give you help, to be a refuge and a strength. He never abandons His people. He never has once abandoned His people, and He never will abandon his people. David said, my God is an ever-present help in times of trouble, a refuge and a strength that I can run into and rely on and find complete support and protection for my life. That's the God who we magnify when we open the Word, His Word of promise. Now, today we're going to read the first five verses of Psalm 103, and here in this psalm, what we see happening immediately is that David is zooming right in on the magnificence of God's character and His goodness towards us. David focuses in. He zooms in the telescope of his heart and mind to magnify God, to magnify His, his beauty and His nature, His character towards us. Let me read to you from Psalm 103, from verse 1 through to verse 5. This is the Word of God. David starts out by saying, verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities? Who heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from destruction? Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies? Who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles? Amazing words. Hallelujah. Amazing words to carry into your everyday. Amazing words to carry and load your life up with. Amazing words to allow your mind to meditate on hour after hour. 
These are not words just to pull out now and again. These are words to impregnate your heart and your mind and your soul with. They will do you well if you remember them. They will do you well if you meditate on them. They will lift you up and bless you and fill your heart with gladness. Don't just turn to them and read them in your daily plan. Meditate on them. Hold them in your heart. Allow them to... to, to, uh, to, to, what's the word? Diffuse all of their power, all of their blessing, all of their rich wonder into your life. Think about them. Wonderful words that are so positive. They're so bright. They show you how God looks at you. You want to see how God looks at you? You want to see what God thinks about you? You want to see God's disposition towards you? He hasn't got a scowl on His face when it comes to your life. These are describing words that describe God's disposition to you, His people. Positive, bright words. There's no doom and gloom here. There's no condemnation. These are strong, confident, triumphal, joyous words. There's no complaint or lament in David's heart. He gets a revelation of God. He gets an understanding of God's character and disposition towards him and to anybody else that would put their trust in him. And that's why David starts by saying, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord. Again, he says it, O my soul, and forget not all of His benefits. David's praise is loud. It's unashamed. It's bold. He can't contain the excitement and the exuberance within him because the Word of God is living inside of him and it's become a reality for him to experience, a reality for him to enjoy. He walks under the forgiveness of God's smile, under the forgiveness of God's favor, under the blessing of His presence, and He has to praise Him for all of the innumerable blessings that He'd received. And He calls Himself never to forget. That's what He's doing. He's reminding Himself, forget not any of the benefits that have been loaded on me. I will not forget any of the benefits that have been loaded on my life as a result of God's favor, as a result of God's goodness, as a result of God steering my course. I'm not going to forget all of the wonder of His goodness and all of the wonder of His mercy and His love towards me. This is the way to live every day. This is the way to wake up in the morning Blessing the Lord, calling your soul and everything with inside of you to rise up and praise His name. That's the way to live. That is the way to experience abundant life. Not as a duty, not as a discipline, but as a need, as a craving, as an experience of life. And David found that as he recounted on God's goodness, as he recounted on the endless blessings for which God had given him. And as a result, his life became an endless song, an endless song of praise, an endless song of gratitude, an endless song 
of worship. And that's why he said, oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad when you invited me to come to the house of God because it's another occasion for me to get together with God's people and just sing and focus our praise on Him. That's how he lived. Another occasion, he said, one thing if I desired, one thing, one thing I've asked for. He narrowed it down to one thing, oh, that I might dwell in your house forever, to gaze upon your beauty. You see, the man was captivated by the presence of God and praising his presence. It's wonderful to live like that. It really is. To live a life of praise, for your life to be an endless expression of song and praise to God's goodness every single, every single day. You know, one of the things that I find amazing is that when I remember the blessings that God has given to me over my life, which are many, I find remembering them is even greater than when I first received them. That's the amazing thing about the blessings of God. When you receive them, it's wonderful. But when you recall them to mind, oh, the, it's, like, it's like a well that gushes. It's like a spring that refreshes. You remember back to the moment that when God did a miracle, you remember back to the moment where God either provided for you or protected you or healed you or delivered you. And you remember that moment. And on remembering, the, the, the blessing is bigger than when you received it because in remembering and recalling and recounting all of those benefits that God has given. A wonderful, a wonderful gush of praise comes from your heart and spirit, and you find Him there in that moment. David knew of that. David knew of that. This man was a man who recalled and recounted all of the blessings that God had given him, and that's why he lived a life. You can track his life through the Psalms. You can track his life through the historical books in the Old Testament. Track his life, and you'll see that it was a life of praise. It was a life of worship. It was a life of, of, of using all occasions to find God and sing and praise before him. As you move through these verses, you see that David, there's a reason why David praises God so exuberantly. There's a reason why David praises God so freely and unashamedly and boldly. And he gets straight to the point why he's calling everything within him to praise God. And it's for this reason. Firstly, he says, the Lord forgives. The Lord forgives all of my iniquities, all of my wrongdoing. The Lord forgives all of my sin. There's nothing like knowing you're forgiven. I'm not just forgiven. There's nothing like knowing you're forgiven all, all of your sins. David is pointed out here that all of his sins and all of our sins have been deleted, have been erased, all taken away under God's forgiving power, God's forgiving goodness, and God's forgiving grace towards us. And just that little word all in the sentence makes all the difference. All of your sins, church, are forgiven. All of your sins, church, are removed. That's why you can praise Him so exuberantly. That's why you can get up every day with a smile on your face, knowing 
that you're walking in his favor. Proverbs 4, I believe, says, But the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. Why does your life shine? Why is your life like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day? I'll tell you why. Because all of your sins have been forgiven. You do not dwell and live in darkness. You live in the wonder of God's light. Hallelujah. Forgiven. You're forgiven. You really are. I was singing a song this week. I'm not going to sing it. Only if you jump up and down and scream, sing, sing, sing. Then I will. Okay, you're not doing that, so I won't. I won't, no. I won't. You're not standing up. <laughs> no, let's. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No. Do you know, I was singing this little song this week, right? And uh, it's a song we used to sing many, many years ago when I was a teenager in a youth group in Merthyr Tidville. And uh, it was fabulous. I don't know where it came from, but, you know, we, we, we would just sing it over and over and over again. It was that type of song. And you'll understand why, right? It was this, I get so excited, Lord, every time I realize I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. I'll sing it. Let me, here we go now. Ready now? Ready now? Right? I'm shy. I need a bigger round of applause than that. I've gone really shy. The cat's got my tongue. I might have to change the key a few times, <laughs> right? It goes like this. I get so excited, Lord, every time I realize I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven. Here we go. Jesus, Lord, you did it all. You paid the price. I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven. I get so excited, Lord, every time I realize I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven, Jesus, Lord, you did it all. You paid the price. I'm forgiven. Got my walking socks on. I'm forgiven. Come on, this is easy, bit. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. Oh, I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. Hallelujah. Listen, why are we forgiven? I'll tell you why. It's been paid in full. It's been paid in full. Your forgiveness has been paid in full. We would sing that song hour after hour after hour. Why? Because singing that you're forgiven is wonderful. You never get bored, right? I tell you now, I never ever got bored about singing about the fact that God had forgiven me of all of my sins. It's wonderful. I sang it in every tune, known to man, in tune, rarely in tune, mostly out of tune, but what a joy it was to remind myself that I'm forgiven. Never forget that. Recall that. Recount that every single day of your life. David points it out that all of our sins have been deleted, have been removed. We are forgiven of all of our sins. Sin has been dealt with. That's what he tells us in verse 3. 
And the verb forgive in verse 3 implies a continuous action. It's not intermittent, this forgiveness. It's not inconsistent. It's a fully comprehensive cover that God applies to your life through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. There's no small print that can catch us out. God's insurance of forgiveness to us in Christ is complete and final. And it's through the unconditional love of God. It's this is, this is what triggers His forgiveness. This is what triggers His goodness. This is what triggers all of the rich resources that He brings to each and every one of us. His unconditional love, like Faye said this morning, His compassion. It's that that triggers God's, love, God's provisions in our lives. Years ago, I remember one night preaching about God's forgiveness that He gives to us, speaking about His unconditional love and how it's His love that triggers His goodness. It's His love that triggers His forgiveness. And that night I knew that the Holy Spirit wanted to reach a person that was in the meeting. I didn't know who it was for, but I knew that there was one person under the sound of my voice that was carrying years of guilt in relation to things that had happened in their past. They couldn't separate themselves from the happenings of the past. They couldn't separate themselves from their history. Their history had a hold on them that would not let go was tightly binding their lives. And I knew this coming into the service that night very simply. I just said to, I just said it, set it out there. I said, if you are here tonight and you are carrying guilt and shame as a result, of things that you've done in your past. And history, your history, has a hold on you that will not let you go. I want to tell you that Jesus is here to set you free. Jesus is here to release you from history's hold so that you won't have to remember all of the things formerly that you've done in your life. You won't have to recall them. You won't have to relive them. Jesus is here to set you free. I didn't know who it was for. I said, listen, whoever you are, I want you to pray with me. I prayed a very simple prayer, childlike. I said, when you place your faith in Jesus, He's going to set you free from your past. He sees your pain. He sees your anguish. He sees the fact that you're carrying all of this guilt and shame, and He's going to set you free. Well, I prayed, and that was it. It didn't appear as if really it applied to anyone in the meeting. But then, as I was just ready in myself to leave, a gentleman came up to me, an old gentleman. I'd never seen him before tall man. He said, son, he said, before you go, can I have a brief word with you? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, when you said what you said tonight at the end of your message in relation to a person carrying guilt and shame all their life, reliving and recounting every day moments of their past that they can't set themselves free from, son, it was me. I'd never seen this man before. He said, I was just passing down the street tonight. He said, I had no intention at all to come into this building. He said, I, before coming into this place, he said, I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. He said, but strangely, as I passed the doors of this place, he said, I felt a need just to come in and see what was happening. He said, as I sat at the back, 
He said, and I listened to the Word of God, you speaking the Word of God in relation to Jesus, desiring to set me free from history's hold, desiring to set me free through His saving grace. He said, in my heart, I believed. In my heart, I received it. And when you prayed that simple prayer, he said, I prayed, trusting. And suddenly, he said, I don't know how to explain this. He said, but suddenly a weight, a weight of the past that was on my life has suddenly left me. He said, see, son. He said, in the Second World War, he said, I worked on a Lancaster bomber. And he said, I was a bomb aimer on that, on that bomber. And he said, at my hand, he, he said, I had to release tons and tons, thousands of tons of explosives all over Germany as we, as we flew night after night over cities and towns, at given moments in our flight, it would be my hand that would pull the lever to release tons and tons of explosives. And I would see the cities and the villages and the towns of people that I would never meet or I would never see light up before me. And he said, son, he said, I've relived those moments that I cannot change. He said, I have, I have relived and recounted those moments and wished so many times that I could change the past actions of my life. But history has had a hold on me all these many years. But tonight, he said, tonight, he said, I'm free. And that old gentleman walked away a brand new man. Why? Why? Because he forgives all of our sins. He forgives all of our iniquities. That's the power of God's goodness. That's the power of His love to release us from anything that would seek to hold us and to bring us down. No, God sets us free. Jesus said, I have come to set you free. You will know the truth. You see, David had the truth in his hand, in his heart, holding on to it. You will know the truth, Jesus said, and that truth, his word, his promise will set, will set you free. Isaiah the prophet saw the same wonder of God's forgiveness towards us, just like David when he said in Isaiah 37, verse 17, Indeed, it was for my own peace that I had great bitterness, but you have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption, for you have cast all of my sins behind your back. Isaiah tells us that sin is like a pit of corruption that corrupts our soul, that imprisons our lives. But God sees our helpless state. God delivers us from that pit of corruption and casts all of our sins behind His back, just like He did for that gentleman. He'd been living year after year after year in a, in a pit of corruption. But that night, God in His mercy, God in His love through the power of the Holy Ghost and the preached Word delivered that man from the pit of corruption and set him on his feet and set him free to go his way. Hallelujah. We don't have to live in a pit of corruption, remembering and recalling sins that we can't separate us, uh, ourselves from. No, we are set free. Jesus has paid in full. The full penalty for our sin. We are, we are forgiven. Again, Isaiah 43, verse 25. 
tells us that God blots out our transgressions. Verse 25, Isaiah gets an understanding and a revelation of God's amazing grace, amazing goodness to forgive us. And says this on behalf of God as he receives the word of God into his heart. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. And I will not remember your sins. God doesn't remember any of our sins. Neither should we. Neither should we. No, he's blotted out our transgressions. And he remembers our sins no more. To blot out means to rub away or to completely erase from all existence. So there's no trace. So there's no evidence. He removes all of our sin and abolishes it completely. All evidence is gone to convict us. We're forgiven. When God declares that he's blotted out our transgressions, He's using the strongest of words. The strongest of language is being used to assure us that we stand faultless before His throne of grace. Blotted out. It's all gone. All trace of sin over your life that would have condemned you, is gone. It's over. This same phrase, to blot out, Paul takes up and uses it in the book of Colossians when he writes to the church. Just like David and Isaiah, Paul tells us that God has blotted out everything that was recorded and written against us by putting it on Christ Jesus on the cross, nailing it, in fact, to Him as our Savior on the cross so that all judgment of sin would be taken from us and placed on Him. Let me read to you. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 through to verse 14, it says this, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, have him forgiven, you see, same language as David is using in Psalm 103, Paul is saying in Colossians 2, two having forgiven all all your trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Having forgiven all, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Love, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, keeps no record of wrong. And perfect love holds no record. It holds no record. The only record that's held against your life or over your life or for your life is the perfect record of Christ's resurrection life as He is seated in heaven, so we are seated with Him. You know, God is saying things in relation to this whole aspect of forgiveness. Faye ministered on Thursday night about this whole aspect of love keeping no record of wrongs. And about forgiveness. And we didn't even know, I, I didn't say to Faye what I was going to be speaking on. And, and she only mentioned the day that, or the Thursday, what she was going to encourage the ladies with on Thursday night. It's the same spirit. The Lord is speaking to us and highlighting to each and every one of us that our sins are forgiven. It's time to get excited. I get so excited, Lord, every time. I realize I'm forgiven. It's time to get excited. You're forgiven. You're free. 
You're whole. You're released. The debt has been paid in full. Nailed to the cross. Oh, how we should worship Him. Oh, how we should praise Him. Oh, how our song and our, our worship should be, be so free in His presence because of all that He's done. Little illustration to help us along. The Greeks would tell us that when we begin life, the ancient Greeks would tell us that as we begin life, life is like a nice clean page. I think that's true. Children are innocent. Life is like a nice clean page, but it doesn't take long before the page gets filled up with all the craziness of life, all the rights and wrongs that we do, and our lives get filled up with all of this writing and record against us. And this is kind of what Paul is saying in Colossians chapter 2. There was a record of life where we had faltered against the laws of God, and we stood condemned because of this record of our wrongs. Our life is a very record, or our life was a very record of all of these wrongs. But Paul tells us that the record of all of our wrongs was nailed to Christ, was nailed to His cross. You know, there's a verse, and I like to bring these verses together when I think about how God has dealt with our sin, how God has forgiven us all of our sins. There's a verse that tells us in the Bible that God is an all-consuming fire. Have you ever read that? He's an all-consuming fire. And when He placed all the record of my wrongs on Christ as an all-consuming fire in His judgment, He gave full vent to my sin. His wrath bore down on Christ as Jesus became sin for me. The Bible says in Corinthians, He became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. What happened to this on the cross? The record of my sin, the record of your sins. Well, at the opening of Jesus' ministry, John the Baptist said this, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. He takes away this record of your sin, this record of your wrongdoing. History's hold against you. He takes it away. Will you believe it? Will you accept it? Will you live in the fullness of it? Let me show you what an all-consuming fire does with our sin. Now, I have the help of some tongs this morning because I don't want to burn my fingers. Record of my wrongs. I can't live with that. I don't want to live with that. I think about it every day. I have to read it. I have to eat it. No, not according to God's Word. Record of your sins. This is what an all-consuming fire does with the record of our sins. Here we go. I'll try not to burn the building down. Here we go. Ready for it?
I wonder if I can remember any of this. Hey. Isaiah says, Isaiah says, he gives us beauty for ashes. Isn't that wonderful? Beauty for ashes. Part of that beauty is forgiveness. It's forgiveness. It's making us whole in Him. Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through to verse 34 says this. Paul, just amazed by the wonder of God's provision in Christ. He says, what shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him freely give us all things? He's saying the same as David. Who shall bring a charge? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is He who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen and is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. We're forgiven. We're forgiven. I'm going to close by saying this. I'm going to ask the musicians and singers to come. I'm going to close in a moment. You know, if forgiveness was all we received, if forgiveness was all we received, my goodness me, it would be more, it would be more than enough. But it's not. It's not. And in the weeks to come, we're going to see that not only does God actively forgive all of our sins in Christ through the cross, He also heals all of our diseases. He heals. That's what David said. He heals all of our diseases. Let's have a rise of faith, a rise of expectation for the healer to be glorified, for the healer to be magnified through His Word, through His promises living inside of us. Read a story just this week of an elderly lady in China. She was in hospital. The doctors could do no more for her. She was about to die, so the family were called in and asked to take her home. She had but a few days to live. But before she left the hospital, a little Chinese nurse came in and gave this lady who was dying a copy of the Gospel of Mark and whispered it in her ear, read this when you go home. This elderly lady, like many across China, had no understanding of Jesus. She'd never heard the good news. She did not know anything. And this little nurse didn't have time to tell her about Jesus, so she just gave her a copy of the Gospel of Mark. Well, the little lady went home. She was taken home just for the last remaining days to live at home with her family. And as she was in bed, she called to her son. She said, please pass me the book that was given to me by the little nurse that she told me to read. She opened the Gospel of Mark and her eyes fell on the first seven words of the Gospel of Mark. This, I'll have to check, is seven. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Eight. The first eight words. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. When her eyes fell on those words... She was instantaneously and miraculously healed. The power of God went into her body. She jumped off her bed, and she was completely restored to health. 
She didn't know what happened, but she knew that something had happened as she read those simple words. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. She went out into the streets and she started to greet her friends again in the village. They all knew that she was on her deathbed, started to ask her, who's your doctor? Who, who is your physician so that we can go to him because we have sick within our village? She said, I haven't got a doctor, but I read this book, and I read these eight words. This is the good news about Jesus Christ. They said, give us the book. They started to pass the book around the village. As people started to read those eight words, suddenly, miraculously, they all started to get healed. Seventy people in that village in China were miraculously and instantaneously healed as they read just the one line of the Word of God. As a result, they started to worship God. They started to give Him praise. All, everything within them started to bless the Lord as they started to recount His goodness and recall His benefits because He had healed their bodies. They found forgiveness for their sins, but also they found that He was healing all of their diseases. The authorities heard, they came in, tried to stamp out this spiritual awakening within that village. And as a result of that persecution, that church grew to over 70,000 believers. I mean, it just spread and grew, and the power of God was manifest in those provinces within China. The Word of God. When God says, I forgive all of your sin, and I heal all of your diseases, He means it. He does not say anything that he does not mean, and he does not waste his words. It is final. Hallelujah. Now, Wayne's going to sing. If you want healing and need healing in your body, in whatever way this morning, I'm going to lay my hands on you and believe that Jesus is going to heal your body physically. You may already have been healed in the worship. You may already have been healed, whether it's in your mind, in your heart, in your spirit, or even physically in your, in your body. You may have already been healed. But if you feel that you need hands laid on you this morning, then I'm going to lay my hand on you and believe that Jesus is going to heal you. I'm going I'm to pray in the name of Jesus and believe that His power is going to go forth and touch your body. That is what I'm commanded to do. Lay a hand, he says. Lay hands on the sick. That's all he tells me to do. A hand, where he, it's an interruption. When, when I lay my hand on you and I remove my hand, the Lord showed me this many years ago. He said, son, you lay the hand and remove it, and when you remove yours, mine remains. I'm going to lay my hand and remove it, and Christ's hand is going to remain on you, and you will recover. God doesn't say you might recover. God says you will recover. Hallelujah. So come forward. Stand to our feet. We're going to sing. And I don't care if it's one person, if it's many people, I will pray. I will lay my hand, and I will pray for you. And we believe that the Word of God, the all-powerful Word of God is going to come into operation and heal our bodies in Jesus' name. Amen.
that Jesus was for you and not against you. You never realize that Jesus actually says that he wants to live in your life and he wants to have a relationship with you. Well, today, this morning, whether you're watching online or if you're in the building right now, I would love to invite you to find a relationship with Jesus. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Maybe you thought, oh, well, do you know what? I'll think about it and maybe I'll do it in a few days' time. I don't know who this is for, but as I was stood on the floor then, I felt the Holy Spirit say, today is the day of salvation. It's time to stop making excuses. You don't need to go home and think about it. You just need to accept this gift that God is giving today and say, this is for me. You've just got to accept the fact that there is a God in heaven who is madly passionate in love with you the way that you are because he created you. The Bible says that before he formed the foundation of the world, he knew you and he didn't reject you and he didn't reject me even though he knew we would fail and we would sin but he said no I accept you I want you I want you to be my child I want a relationship with you so today today is the day of salvation and he is but a prayer away the Bible says that we are to call on the name of the Lord and we shall be saved so if you are in this place today and you know you don't have a relationship with Jesus Jesus, then cry out to him now. Why don't you pray something like this? Say, Jesus, I need you in my life. Today, I ask you to come and live in my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Thank you today that you give me a new start. I want to accept you into my life as my Lord and Savior in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, if you prayed that prayer, I'm telling you, you have completely changed the course of your life. Absolutely, in that simple declaration, you have changed the course of your life. The Bible says you've gone from the kingdom of darkness and you have entered into the kingdom of his marvelous light. And he gives you a new start and he gives you a new nature. And he says you are new because you have accepted accepted Jesus and what he has done for you today. How exciting, hey? How exciting. And our encouragement to you would be to keep coming to church. Keep coming to church on your way out. We'd love to gift you with a Bible. You can go to our welcome desk and we would love to give you a Bible to help you on your journey as well as a magazine filled with stories of people just like you who have made that decision that I am going to ask Jesus into my life. And they've seen God do amazing things. Amen. Well,